you're live upstairs, you're live on YouTube. Kate England, you approached me for a reason. Or you referred to me for a reason. I was referred to you by a gentleman on Facebook. Um, he directed me because I had started a petition in regards to how veteran suicides are recorded in the UK. I saw that going around, but I didn't realise it was you until when you got in touch. Then I, then I, I stalked you, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I saw it online that you started a petition. Um, go into more detail about the petition. It has got over the ten thousand signatures, um, which the government have responded with a kind of non-generic, um, normal answer. Exactly what they're already saying. So. Nothing very controversial or helpful. Um, it's slowed down slightly because um, I'm a wife of quite an ill person and four children. So I find it hard to find time. But when I kind of put a lot of, get on a lot of sites, try and push it more, um, it tends to increase and go up. But um, yeah, I am. It's trying to get that out there. It's really hard, even within a social media environment that we are now. It's momentum. It's keeping momentum. Yes. But, but the petition, what do you want? What tell? Because assume that people don't... I know what's in the petition, obviously, okay. because you're here. Um, assume that I don't. Assume okay. that listeners and watchers don't. So what do you want? Um, at the moment, there is no specific um, recording of suicide and who that suicide affects. So... <sighs> say say like this weekend we can give a hugely good example a very sad example but there was an incident this weekend involving a veteran now that incident at the moment won't be recorded as a veteran so it will go down as a normal well, not, a suicide isn't normal it's a it's a cry for help but um it will just be plain logged as suicide so at the moment, any government figures that they they record back to ourselves as a public is done as research. So small groups of people, average amounts, and then that taken into ratios in that way. So it isn't a true figure. So actually, when they're doing these things, they're not giving true specific figures. In America and Canada, Australia, they used to do this sort of thing but found they started to actually specifically record um, suicides in veterans and serving soldiers. I think recording serving suicides is a lot easier than um, recording um, veteran suicide because there's, there's just a vast number of veterans within those country. Mm -hmm. And also within the country, you in Scotland, you have a different system. They don't have a coroner system. It's completely separate, different. But again, they don't record who that person is, um, whether that's a veteran or not. But also, if you step away from coroners and suicide, well, it's still including suicide, say attempted suicide, majority of health trusts within the UK do not record whether that person within their mental health department um, being looked after by that mental health department is actually a veteran. Okay. So it's, it is a, it's a, it's a long road, but we need to start somewhere. And this is, I don't know how the government would say, a cost effective because it is, it's adding on to the system that's already placed. They're saying it's not not cost effective. Well, that's that's maybe the suggestion. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, so by so with, with what you would like in the petition and other people would like, obviously there's there's thirteen and a half thousand signatures at the minute. Are you go on. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I was just going to say, within the system, within social media at the moment, there's a lot of. I don't want to say publicity because it's not publicity. It's it's an awful thing. But some suicides within veterans are being publicised in that way. So more public knowledge is there. But there is only 
so the families have got to be doing giving their permission to do that and saying that's okay and I can understand why some families wouldn't want to do it or wouldn't know how to do it or to get their voices heard um I know there's a few ladies coming forward now in regards to husbands that have committed suicide but you know this is at the moment I think there was 33 suicides within a very short amount of time and you see it in the public and then you look at the government figures you work it out over the year and it's well above what they are statistically saying is and at the moment they are saying that is way below civilian population and how can you tell if that's true or not? It's a it's a huge debate. From from, it, it's not a it it shouldn't really be a debate. I, I I'm not saying I don't have the figures right. I'm not saying that I'm using this. If you as you relax, you can and sit. If you want to sit back, whatever you can. This will move. You can move it. Yes, it. That's it. That's it. And it turns as well like crazy. That's it for you as you chill out. Put, there you go. Amazing. You're back <laughs> on the couch. Um, where was it going? What was it saying? There's a, there's a, sorry, so your petition wants the government or coroners to make it, to, to make it uh, standard to record that if, when a suicide occurs, that if that person was ex-service personnel or not. Yes. I, I would suggest that would be useful as well for high, high risk, high risk careers, jobs, per, per, or high stress, police fire persons i'm just i'm not saying no, i'm just saying, if because if you there's a whole, that would be useful a whole plethora the the focus on veterans at the minute is and you're you hit the nail on the head with the the are you suicide rate at the moment and the and how that contrasts with what the uk government are saying is really the case in terms of statistics it, the suggestion is from what you've seen what i see in social media and our military connections yes. um on on the suicide thing is that it's people say epidemic so strong there's it's a lot of it happening and, and um and uh more than i've ever known um uh i've had three now three mates in the last year and a half two years before that none none before that you know in that three in the last two years uh well that's an increase um now what that's done, you, you can you can speculate, and people and people will be linking this to things like the Iraq conflict, Afghan, um, and when I was looking, I looked at the government's response yeah. to, to the petition, looked at it, and, and it, it's lengthy, it's and it's lots of I did at this link in this report, this link, okay, all right, you, what they what I saw in it is they're referencing things that they, they're not good reference points, so they're saying that uh, one of the figures is that the one of the things they're saying is that the percentage of um, suicides in military personnel, ex-military personnel, based on a study that was done by such and such, I can't remember his name, um, in 2015, yes. um, indicates that actually the, the, the suicide rate is below. below okay? yeah. But as you pointed out, one of the things with this is they're not capturing all the information. They're not capturing all. It's, it's incomplete data, right? Plus... Um, 2015 was three years ago and when and how up to date was that information in 2015 that was probably in, that study was done in 2015 the date was probably from two three four five years before the other two reference points they had was um they there was a there was there was a study done on veteran on on sorry on suicides after the falklands war and there's a study done on suicides after the iraq war uh no after the first gulf war so, yes right now those are difficult they, I'm not taking anything away from um, the people who were involved in those. They were fucking horrific. Okay, certain parts of of the Gulf, certain parts of the Falklands. Would, I, I wouldn't wish those on anyone. Like horrendous, horrendous things. Okay. My uncle was writing back to my mum saying he had done what twenty odd years in service, mm. got to warrant warrant officer class one. Mm. I can't. I'm I'm putting in my years and then I'm leaving because he was on the front line. Which of the, of the first Falklands, Gulf, the first Gulf, Gulf, Gulf yeah, yeah, yeah just, it, was, it was enough. Yeah. I mean, he'd done Ireland, you know, yeah. he was with rifles, yeah. um, you know, it's that long ago he started off in green jackets and amalgamated into rifles. Mm -hmm. 
but I think people nowadays because I would say I mean I remember the you know um ah, man, Iraq tremendously well because you know you had the night media it was all on um, BBC News all through the night before you had lots of different channels yeah. way before that <laughs> and um you know and then Afghan Afghan became it became very within the public eye and I think people started to wait for the casualty lists on the on the BBC at six o'clock oh, yeah. waiting for some you know it became that whereas before I think with golf the golf and I know Iraq was but I think Afghan were very meteorized you know it was seemed to be always in the news and there was always a charity forefronting it and I think that is something to do with social media how it is nowadays mm-hmm. But, um, you know, how far has that gone in such a small amount of time? No. I, but, yeah, yeah, sorry. It's all right, sorry. Just to, just to clarify what we're saying with, with the reference points, you know, uh, Falcon's War and the Iraq as well. Um, the, the, my, the, the different, you can't, you can't judge, uh, you can't compare the impacts of the, uh, of the Iraq campaign, and when I say that, I mean Iraq 2003 to when did it go to 2011 2012 to Gulf One year invasion of Iraq. Two different, completely different types of conflict. One went on for a long time, but was on average probably less, um, less uh, kinetic, less hostile, but went on for a longer period of time. The other one was hard and fast in Iraq. So they impact different people in different ways, and and. By the very nature, probably impact less. So Gulf One absolutely impacted less people than Gulf Two because there were just more people involved in Gulf Two. You can't compare the Afghan campaign, okay, which they yeah, which was um, had some fighting, uh, which conventional warfare type fighting, which they there was comparisons to be made at the Falklands. You can't compare the two. No. In it from a terms of mental health or whatever or whatever impact you want to talk about on um on on Joe Bloggs, RAF maybe, or, or, or Army, because they're two different types of conflict. They went on for years. People went around and did three, three, and in some cases four, some cases five tours of Afghan. Again, generally on a lower, on average, a lower sort of uh, volatility level than what the Falkners was. If you think like Mount Longdon or Mount, um, oh God, what was the other one? Oh, I'm going to kick myself. The other Scots one. Oh, I can't remember, but those were, you know, a few yeah. hours of absolute hell. craziness. Yeah. Hell. Yeah. Absolute hell. Like, what was long then? 12 hours long? All like crazy. I didn't ever do that. Like a 12 hour crazy mental battle like that in Afghan. I did a couple of hours, you know, and never like that long. So you can't compare the two. You can't. It's, it's just a duration more because, because it, there's all sorts of off off shoots of it when there's more people involved in the campaign then sort of more it just gets treated differently amongst each other again with the media with civilians the way civilians does it with soldiers and airmen and and um and uh navy. sailors and navy yeah, yeah. you know it's what i'm saying is that where the government is saying well um the on in a, on gulf one and in the falklands well, there wasn't a massive increase of suicide after, so that means there hasn't been this time. They're not good reference points. No. Different. And plus, PTSD, well, generalising PTSD, it can take up to 10 years or so. It can be a long time. And also, I mean, we're referencing war. We're referencing war. But actually, <coughs> there are instances, you saw, there's other instances of PTSD. You know, you can go back to within the services that you may experience in civil in your life, you know, which affect veterans but are still because i actually got an email from somebody um from somebody that worked from the mod on a medical standpoint from a mental health standpoint but he was a local councillor in my area and he said well you can't have ptsd if you have you've, if you've done anything less than three year service oh i've seen something oh, about this oh my yeah. god i just yeah i, I but, it made me so upset but the ignorance the but there's that ignorance where ptsd is a military thing no are you it's, flipping mental you can you can fall over. You could fall over by your head against that wall, bad. End up in hospital. Not even end up in hospital. I've, I get people, people get it for the craziest things. Not even have a physical injury. Yes. I, I, I meant I like witnessing 
witnessing a hideous car crash. You can get PTSD from that. It, it's that is a counselor, especially the counselor, ex-military. The ignorance of that. I saw something. I thought I saw something else on that. I think it was yesterday, and someone was saying that. I think it was to do with might be to do with the mental health side of things, or or I know it's to do with um, getting veterans treated in the NHS and prioritising all that. And they were saying, well, let, let's ease the strain in the NHS. They, people should not be eligible for the treatment if if they've served less than a year. I thought, why does that? Why does that? <laughs> it means nothing, does it? I mean, I was speaking. I was on a radio program in Oxford, and I was speaking to a gentleman. I can't remember his name. If he's really listening to this, I'm so sorry. He writ bombs for breakfast. Bombs for breakfast. Was it bombs for breakfast? No, no, no. And he was such an interesting man. I mean, I think he, if I remember rightly, forgive me if not, he served with the rifles. Okay. And um, he was talking about the same thing, you know, about PTSD. What you, you know, it's not just a military thing, but the treatment, or I'd say with military, it's a lack of wanting to admit there's a problem because with the people, not just men, I see people referencing men in the military a lot, and it's men and women. Mm-hmm. It's it's. Because I think you have to have, you have to be, you know, you have to have a huge amount of resilience in what you do. And to admit, or oh, actually something maybe not quite right, is a bit of a, it's having to admit, you know, you've, you've got a bit of a flaw, you know, something's happening there. And that's another thing is engagement. I think that's a lot harder within the military community, whether serving or veteran, because you've been, you've gone through that process of being trained. And being, you mm. know, not, not I mean you've got, um, but I think PTSD has been stigmatised quite a lot within the military community, if you see what I mean. It's um, a, a big problem as well. Although the government say, you know, it's open, it's being dealt with. But I've had people approach me saying, I've got a relative. They've stood forward, said I've got, you know, I'm, you know, I'm suffering. And they've been taken back from duties and... At that point, you know, they've gone through and they said, to her, you know, I'm, I've am i gone through, the, you know, gone through some counselling. I said, no, I'm fine because they don't want to be taken away from what they're doing. They want to be. Mm. Yeah. It's not PTSD that gets stigmatised. It's not PTSD. No, it's, no I, it's, is not, it it's not. mental health? It's not stigmatised externally. So um, and I'm talking from personal experience, not from PTSD. I'm talking about experiencing what the machine is like. I'm, you know, I was infantry. Yeah. So, and again, that's probably extremists of, the um the uh macho um you know well that macho strength no weakness thing and it's it's more it's not it's it's um it's 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 not one to expose a weakness and and ptsd being being perceived as a weakness so you don't bring it up it's not ptsd stigmatized i think it depends where you are and who you're with and who's in command maybe or so forth or who's your who's your support structure Mm -hmm. because I guess I'm coming from a a partner's point of view Mm -hmm. and um, I'm really lucky because I've met so many different people um, mums wives ex-serving soldiers serving you know men and women and you get a whole barrage of different things that have happened to people it's not all the same and it doesn't you can hear you can hear some really heartbreaking things and you think well why did that get so far you know they were saying and why did that and but again I think I think I still think that PTSD is stigmatized even among the guys that have PTSD Mm. you know that are suffering they even stigmatize themselves my husband, forgive me for watching this, but he constantly says, I mean, his, I think anybody that's read my article about myself, my husband, my husband was sections at the end of last year. It got so severe. Um, and he'll still say, I've not got a problem. And then 10 minutes later, he'll say, I'll say, well, why haven't you done that? Because I've got a mental health problem. And it's like, ah, I think I'm going to scream because, you know, there's issues. But it's wanting to talk about it, it's being open. Um, I'm quite lucky in the fact that yeah, my husband is really supportive of what I'm doing. 
because you can see the benefit in being so open now, especially as a partner, because I think partners get forgotten, forgotten sometimes within the whole whole thing. And we kind of, we're the carers. We're, I mean, I've been called a care coordinator so often, it's unbelievable. Um, uh, but, you know, what can you do? It's, um, you choose, you choose, you stay, and you get on with it. Were you with James before he started suffering? No, we were friends before, but we we started properly dating in the 2011, and um, he had he was he was drinking an awful lot. Was he still serving him? No, he was out then, but yeah. he was constantly in Hereford. So with his friends that were still serving, and you just think, <clears throat> you know, he lost his license, driving license. Um, that caused problems. He was constantly going from his parents, you know, to subsidise because you know you can't sustain that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a few jobs, but he couldn't settle in a job. He just not go, you know. He just couldn't do it. And then when we probably started dating, he just didn't leave. And what do you mean he didn't leave? Just didn't leave. <laughs> he, he sort of turned up his bag one day and just didn't leave. I've been told that's quite normal, but. Um, <laughs> he was kind of yeah and it was um so we, we we've had a few breaks because of certain things in relation to what's been going on but you know not everybody's the same not every relationship's the same you know you either you at that point where you can see an end you can see a level point or you're not and nobody is better or worse for that that is a personal choice and but to me PTSD is I mean my head, head, husband also had a head injury in 2003 which apparently by all studies I love the word studies there seem to be so many out there all quite varied and quite different um, makes him more susceptible to PTSD um and CT isn't it Pardon? CTE, isn't it? CTE, CTE yeah. Massive subject. Mm. Huge in America. I, could, I could wish I could remember what it stands for. It's, um, oh, God. Uh, I want my phone now to could, Google. Uh, um, what was it? Chronic? It's no, to do with repetitive, um, so like small concussions. I will find out that. Yeah. So look, um, like, see if this works. Google, tell me what CTE stands for. According to Boston University, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, is a progressive degenerative disease of the brain found in people with a history of repetitive brain trauma, including symptomatic concussions as well as asymptomatic subconcussive hits to the head that do not cause symptoms. Cheers, Google. You, you're alive, then. Uh, CTE, there we go. Yeah, so so uh, repeated or um, head injury yes. can make you more susceptible other things, including um, so it's, um, depression. One of them, yeah. yeah it's, it mirrors PTSD basically. Um, huge studies of America. America seems to be leading the way. Mm-hmm. Um, Canada and Sweden and Australia are pretty much, you know. Well, with the CT, another thing it can it, it can produce is, um, and this is when it's, when I say can, it seems to be like a high high probability of the chance of you developing it um, if you've got CT is um, erratic behaviour. They they reckon now, and this is from a study, that all American football players have CT. All all of them. Yeah. Not they re- that's what they studied the cross section of them and gone, fucking hell, they've all got it. They've all got it. Again, like PTSD affects it in different ways. Anyway, so you say, I mean, this comes back to the head injury. So um when 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 you so you got with James in you started dating 10 and 11 ish. No, well, um, no, that's wrong. Sorry, 2009, 2010, something okay. like that. Yeah. When, uh, how did how did you get from there to identifying as an issue if it was not already identified? <laughs> Lucky <laughs> <a> fix. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just terrible car experiences. You know, just being so hyper vigilant, just on edge, just. Oh, driving driving awful um you describe to me what you mean um constantly watching what's around 
getting I think a lot of wives with PTSD or you know I've seen a lot of this today about being angry at every everything going you know if the driver doesn't indicate you know um if somebody cuts them up you know not deliberately maybe you know we all do stuff on the road you know we it takes a few seconds to do something wrong doesn't it and it's just every tiny thing you know and you're constantly going oh this isn't you know the experience that i'm quite enjoying really it's Mm. getting a bit um did that was that something increased as turn on um, was it not there at the start I had, oh, I don't know actually, to be quite honest. I may have, because we had a few journeys at the start when we were traveling from Oxford to Cardiff mm-hmm. and it was very close quarters to get places. So, you know, it's like, oh. but, um, you know, and you kind of forget, you know, not everybody has good car journeys. I know, I think nowadays I am more mm-hmm. about driving because <laughs> I think that's kind of rubbing off onto me. But um, we've had, oh, when well, one Pacific incident in 2011 just seemed, you know, there were cer- there were certain things happening. You just think, oh, this isn't quite right. I mean, I've been, you know, in relationships before, not experienced this, mm-hmm. not enjoying it. And um, and then you get to 2011 and his friend, um, Richard Scanlon, was killed in Afghan. Everything just went boom. And from disappearing to drinking again, to just just not being able to talk like a you know not being able to engage not just our whole relationship is again when we kind of had a break where we lived apart from each other we were still together but there was that gap um just horrendous um didn't have a good time at the time just when I um when I was with James I was still married well, I wasn't living with my, you know, we'd yeah. separated. And that relationship with my ex-husband seemed just to, so relation, everything came a bit volatile, you know, anything like Little said, you know, when you see people don't Oh, your like, relationship with your ex-husband became no, volatile, I think, with, with Jim's. Him, with yeah, him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that all became very volatile. It, was, it wasn't a great relationship. So everything, was, everything gets blown out of proportion. So, so you do something wrong. I remember my son was icing a cake once and he was about three and he was missing the cake with icing and James was meant to be helping. He just couldn't do it because it was, you know, it just couldn't cope with him missing Missing. the cake. So he he just walked out. I was like, what is this about? Mm. And he's like, I just can't, I can't handle just because I just, just, I don't know, it becomes too much. Mm -hmm um and then so well with our story we approached combat stress took us a year to get there because by the time we got an appointment jane we got to leatherhead and had to turn back so what do you mean we went for an appointment at combat stress got an appointment yeah he literally got to the gates and went can't do this drove all the way back to oxford again because he just couldn't go in took us another year before he actually walked in the door reception of combat stress um, All the way from Oxford to Leatherhead. Did they have anywhere closer? No, they've closed. They've got two. They had three centres then. Now they've they've cut one, haven't they? And they're down know. to two. Yeah, they've cut one up north. I thought Commerce Stress are quite big, are they not? No, I think they've got. They're very. They're coming up to their hundredth centenary next year, I think. But they are very much because they're funded. A lot of their stuff is funded by the NHS, so treatment, the six week stays, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And with the government sourcing out now, so till service. Mm-hmm. Do you know tills? No. Um, so that's a transition interventional link service, I think it is. Okay. And so that is for mental health, for um, military, having that bridge from leaving into civilian life, but also for veterans. Um, and now, as of the April the 1st, they started up with a complex mental health team, right, okay. which I'm smiling because <laughs> I rang on the 1st of or um, first of April on that day and said about James. And they basically said, no, he's too severe, he's too complex. And I thought, it's in his title. You, you know, this is meant to be for that extreme section of um, mental health for veterans or tra- people transitioning out of the armed forces. 
So and they said it, that his situation was too complex. Yeah, What's too complex, it? too severe. Yeah. Have, it's all oh, complex. It is. It's, it, it's the severity of the symptoms is, is the difference, isn't it? Well, combat stress told him that he, they um, said that he did his two weeks day and then business has got a lot worse. Anyway. They said they, what, sorry? They said he could, They he was too severe for them to treat. Yeah. So it came out of their box of what they, the treatments they do, basically, because yeah. he, he basically isn't stable enough. Um, Help for Heroes were wonderful, stepped in. And there, because we'd got no time posting, and they said, look, have you heard about the Till Service? We went to Till Service. They were amazing, but at that point, James isn't stable enough, and they passed on to the local mental health team, who then were meant to do stabilisation course, whatever that entails, and never did it. Even with the, the Armed Forces Covenant, mm. where, you know, if the treatment... No, never happened. And they kind of passed it back to Help for Heroes in Tidworth okay. and wanted James to travel there each all the time to go and do treatment. How far is that from Oxford? An hour and a half, two hours, nice. depending on traffic. So it's quite a while with children in nursery and um, school. And I'm the one doing the while driving. So we turned that down. And so I spent the next month the Combat Mental Health. And I just wanted to scream at their answer because I just thought, where do we go? Where do where does he fit within all this? There's a lot of organisations. So, where do, and I'd heard of another lady being turned down, her husband being turned down by complex mental health being too severe, not stable enough. Um, so I went to the papers because I had enough. When was this? Um, it's quite a few months ago now. Was it back? In July, was it? So, so all that time trying to get some stable well, what from treatment analysis. We've gone. Know. We're going back from 2011. I first approached combat stress. So what are we in now? Come up to two, we're 2018. Come up to 2019. Never having any continuity. Never having. Well, come. Health for Heroes have been really good to us as a family and singly. But you know they can only do so much with mental health. And yeah, there's all these different organisation stuff, but no, we didn't touch them. Sorry, <clears throat> it gets quite upsetting. There's, no, I, un, un, understandably, um, uh, from what I know of of dealing with multiple organisations to do with mental health, wretched mental health, it's the way I see it is there are a, a million brilliant assets out there. Yeah, yep. definitely. There is the coordination is a nightmare. Standardization is a nightmare. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, you, you can't. I'm not saying you do. No. I try not to hold it against the individual organisations because of the job they're up against. Combat stress, for example. A friend, one of the one of the mates who killed himself. The the family had approached combat stress, and again, I. This is just an example, and it just is chain. If you call it stress an example, you've already mentioned them. The family had approached them, and they took an inordinate amount of time to get from. And I only know this is as much as I know. I don't know the ins and outs. I don't know what corresponds with beforehand. If they tried to get my mate to go there or what to there, how far away it was, all the rest of it. But between the point of them contacting uh, combat stress, months passed, and he killed himself before he was even. He, not not maybe not the same common stresses no. point. It's going back to there's a load of assets there. Common stress is an asset. Help the who is an asset. The NHS is an asset. The flipping the 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 psychiatrist, the therapist, all that, they're all assets. The coordination between it's is an shocking. absolute nightmare. It's a shame we can't have something like the VA in America. What's that? Um, veterans. It, it basically links everything. So okay. you come into it very military wise, and it feeds off. So they have lots of. They are the main organisation. So if you imagine like a chart, they have everything. So they're the ones that coordinate. So it isn't various charities and you're going from one to another. You happen to apply to each charity singly. I filled out so many forms I couldn't tell you. Um, you go to one approach and you go from there. So yeah. you're not constantly having to kind of find your way in a minefield. of diff There are so many different military charities did it's you did you get a, did you get a veteran's handbook veteran's no. passport did you get that no no, no, no. 
the NHS will give you a, a veteran's passport and it's a um, passport to health and it's a little uh, A5 sort of binder and um, and you it's like it's like an action plan you go right you've done this and then your next thing is this and this you're going to see and the only problems are doing this and da -da -da -da. but um, uh, you know this part of the problem with some that's great you know I'll have the handbook. It's great. Guess what? I'm not going to guess what? I'm probably not going to be very good at doing what the handbook says or filling it in or writing in. Yeah, or blah, 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 blah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm saying me, I'm generalizing because the people who kind of suffer from these issues in general don't want to even approach the issue. They want to hide from it. So the last thing I want to do is sit down for anybody. Like... My husband got asked to do a mood diary like, um, recently by his mental health coordinator at the local mental health trust. And I just felt myself going, he's never gonna do it you know i can do it but then that's my perspective not his how he's you know only he knows what's going on inside him but i think then you're asking a lot of somebody on whatever spectrum they are suffering it doesn't matter what where they are you know <laughs> for somebody to sit down to think about at that point right uh, you know I, i'm feeling a bit down let's put it down in my phone or write it down I'm feeling a bit sad. I'm going to do that now because by the time you get to bed, you know, I know my husband getting him to bed is a bit of a nightmare. And then getting tablets, you know, waiting for those to kick in. He's not, he's not thinking about that. He's just, and you know, it's okay having these I come touchy feely things, but whether or not people are going to do them, because I know me at the moment, I would do them, but. I say I'm okay, but if I wasn't, if I was on that spectrum, I don't think I would. I don't think I'd care enough. I don't care enough about getting dressed. I don't know, care enough about having a shower. I don't care enough about having a drink. Am I going to write something down? Mm. Sorry. Mm. It's just like, oh, well, that's mm. another thing by the wayside. So, so the VA in America, is that a, is that a government, a government organization? Yeah. Well, it's military. It's still, I think it's still within the military so you'll get injured, people still serving, veterans, and this, it's all a combined... So it's part of the Department of Defence. Yeah, maybe. it's kind of, it's really, you know, it's militarised. It's not like, say, our local mental health team or whatever. It's very still military. So you've got that kind of... My husband, I hate to keep going back, but he always says, you know, well, they're not, civil, they're not military. They don't know, you know. Mm. And they're being, you know, they're, they're going, how are you today? And he's like, I'm going away, fuck off. <laughs> you know, whereas um, we met a gentleman recently at um, the Office of Enablement and um, he's ex-RAF. And he was very, you know, straight to the point, very... And my husband found it so much easier to talk to him because he was being pacific. He, was being, he wasn't being touchy-feely, but that might just be my husband. But he found it a lot easier to actually feed back to them, not sit back and go, oh, my God, am I going to have to sit through this again? Mm. I, he felt like he had to answer, he had to give an answer back, which to me is um, is good. But very much, I don't know, I think everybody thinks differently, don't Everybody's a different person. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, one yeah. mould won't fit, may not fit another person. But within the people I've met, you know these guys are still very you know they're in civilian life but like clothes stuff like that is very you know uh, you know getting things right is still pretty much and i know when my husband is down is when you know he hasn't done you know the things he does it looks a bit i love my husband's bit by the way but it looks a bit shabby you know he looks a bit shabby that. but <laughs> God, you know i just think if you look at somebody, if, if I think people looking at my husband now in a day-to-day -day life. I, we went to Legoland a while ago, and it took a lot for my husband to go. Yeah. And at the point we were at the gates, he was doing this. You know, he was shaking. What um, What makes him anxious with it? Is it anxiety? What? Yeah, well, he has a lot. He has ang anger issues. He has anxiety. He has... But with the, not wanting to go into Legoland, for example. Um, anxiety, lots of people, lots of bag, 
you know, lots of unknowns, um, waiting. So waiting with a lot of people about, well, you know, if we're moving quick through, a set, you know, somewhat to somewhere, he's okay because he's moving quickly. If we stop and he's looking round, well, that becomes an issue, you know. Is he able to articulate what, what, get, what worries him? Or not, no, really. you can just tell by his body language and he's no, no, I mean, oh, I, sorry, no, I mean, as it has he like, you know, as he meant, as anything in the past uh, about how he's feeling yeah, in those situations, because or is it just a general? It's, he doesn't say, you see, this is the problem mm. as well. He doesn't um articulate, he doesn't tell, but it's the physical signs. But physical signs of my husband doing stuff in front of people that don't understand, I mean, my, my husband's being a oh, you know the way he's acting is you know strange yeah and they don't understand whereas i can look and go okay mm-hmm. we'll, we'll have some time out we'll go somewhere quiet we can assess you know but yeah so when we were at legoland a gentleman at work there was my husband was so agitated he was we're in a kids program to, um, a playground to get away you know just to be away from the crowds yeah and there wasn't many people there at the time and he was just like and the guy was just looking and I just thought, oh, I don't really want to have to explain to you. Mm. So I just smiled and tried to get, well, you know. Stuff them. You don't have to, you know. It's, it's, just... it's generally like that. It's, you know, what people perceive can often not be right. And that's in general life, not just, you mm. know, my husband. But I'm surprised yeah. you got him in there, given, I mean. Get, I, it just... was because my son wouldn't stop going on about it. And he was just so mindset. And we'd, we'd worked up to all this. So. I kind of, it's really weird, but I kind of have to safeguard. I have to think of everything that's going to go on. So the trip down there, we're going to need fuel. We're going to get there. What's it going to be like with people? So we're trying to avoid like, you know, like really busy days during the summer holidays or whatever. Try to go when it's colder, when we, people may not go or raining. It's a good example. Mm. Um, just, or I'm trying to plan out the whole day. So the kids are distracted and doing what they want to do and we can kind of fast track around so he isn't thinking no, about yeah. things and people yeah. it's um interesting yeah it's not easy it's not easy it's not uh, yeah um it's not like being a wife sometimes or a partner i can quite understand why ever hearts get quite you know down about the whole thing because the whole thing is so frustrating. Well, it's a dream, but, um, but I, 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 I imagine, you know, I, I've never, I've not been there, but um, I'll swap you. But there. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, but uh, what I mean, look, I'm not going to be a therapist. I don't have a clue. But yeah, I mean, he's how supportive he is of you doing this shows you know it, 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 it the first thing is like not the first one of the things is acknowledging i mean he's come here with you today obviously yeah. he sat in the car you know <laughs> i mean that honestly that when i met him out there and, and he he said he didn't come in and then i shook hands and we said hello and then and then he didn't want to come in he didn't want to you know it's only me you and, and bars upstairs but he didn't want to come in that upset me with that because be, not because it's a slight on me but because a person to be in that that mental position and hey he was sound you know but to think what God, I it must be horrendous to think I I don't feel comfortable going into the, probably the, the quietest environment. So just I've you know I just want to help them and go fix you. Well, he's you um know? he's going off with battle back. Have you ever heard of battle back? I have heard of battle back, but go on. I... Battle back girls, and um, he's going with them for like a day event thing, but he is going to. We have had to book him a hotel. Mm-hmm. You know, like with a friend, also a veteran, and they and they know each other really well, so they're staying together. But constantly, he's thinking about like, is it going to be okay to put golf clubs in the in the room? It's like, yeah, it's fine. Is it going to be what? Sorry, is it be okay to keep my golf clubs in the room? <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> if they got oh. this, have they got that? And it's just like, oh, uh, battle back. The golf days. Yeah, the golf days. There's another battle... organisation, does it? On or is course. it the same one? On What's... Course Foundation. On Course, yeah. Sorry, right, yeah. I've another golf, really yeah. good organisation. So James plays golf. He does. Badly. Because <laughs> hopefully... Because <laughs> I'm, bad I as well. I'm bad as well. <laughs> Only those of Battle Back or On Course could tell me. Um, but um, he comes back and tell it's terrible. And then he wins something. So I'm like, it can't huh? be that bad, yeah. you know, when you come back with a voucher. Yeah. But yeah, he... Um, 
he engages with them and he doesn't engage he'll have where well, he won't engage so if he doesn't know somebody's going on it he'll be like i can't go because i don't know oh really I can't okay. yeah he has to, you know he, to know people did it's he know everyone on the first time um, see no that was on course he went of his own accord which i find really mind you i am a bit pushy <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine yeah. you know i'm like you know you need to get out of the house so you need to yeah. So, but um, he found out about on course about from combat stress actually. So, oh, really? yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he's done things with them before. But he got offered to go to Spain with Battle Back. He's like, no, I can't cope. I can't do that. When did he start that then? Oh God, when did he start? When did he come with on course? I think it might have been two thousand seventeen, or he started just to do. He doesn't do it all the time. He does like individual things. They apply, and then whether you get a place or not, or whether you want to go. I'm such a good vocab for all this thing. I've been telling my other friends because I sing in the military guys choir as well. And there's a lot of... I saw that. I, I know, that. I'm all over the place. <laughs> um, a lot, uh, one of my friends from the military guys choir, she's recently gone on course because I've been a bit pushy about her going on that as well. Kind of, those are details. Stuff. She, she's a wife? Mm, she is, she's ex-military. She's ex-RAF. Oh. See, I, um, I sing at RAF base, so predominantly RAF which my husband predominantly um, takes the mickey out of my friend. And, 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 and rightly you should. <laughs> <laughs> Joke, joking, I have. Um, uh, I guess look at Battle Back. Yeah, that's good. I'm not, I, on course, I try to organise, I say I, myself and my business partner, Liv, we try to organise a couple of things to get them on. Was it me and Liv? Me and Liv, John. To get them on a couple of courses in Colchester. It never came off. <clears throat> um yeah, I've heard of those guys, but going sorry, going sorry. going back to um, the petition, mm -hmm. right? So the petition is on, and that, that's all it wants. It, all the petition is asking for is the coroners to re record in wh where suicide or deaths are concerned, yes. yeah, um, whether the person is ex service or not, right? Yes. Um, so we, there's a problem with that, uh, maybe you may have you probably got the answer is. How how I'm a coroner, okay. Yeah. A body comes into me and it's a suicide. Um, male or female, whatever. How do I go? That how do I go? I, you, this person's ex service is. Is it with what database? You would ask. I guess primarily you would go to hopefully the family or the person because they would have that information. If not, not all. Everybody always has family. That is a difficult question, to be quite honest, because like everything, main information comes from relatives. Um, that is a really hard answer. Well, if they, I'm hard just thinking we're through thrash it out now. I mean, look, I've got a, I've, one of the things that surprised me recently. I've got a, a recently found out I've got a, a mate who's in the nick, close to, uh, I know, right, uh, yeah. close to me, I think geographically close yeah. to where we are sitting right now, just by chance. I don't think he's in there for long. I'm still trying to get older and find out what. But it's surprised. Who is really surprised he is that he's in the neck. Um, and from what I've heard, the reason is it's 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 really it's really minor. You know, it's it's not theft and that. Anyway, um, when I got in touch with, so I found out about for someone else. I thought, well, look, you, and he's been in there a few weeks at this point, I think. Um, and I got on to the regimental association and said to the welfare officer and said. Yo, Laura, Laura McFellini is the power edge welfare so association lady. It's a brilliant lady. I said, yo, you know, such and such. Yes. He's in the neck. Oh, well, she didn't know him personally. He's, he's in the neck. Oh, I'll send you the details. Yeah. What can you do? Well, I'll send her the details and, and went from there. And I I needed to get his date of birth to be able to arrange a visit. Like, you, to go on, to, it's on uh, gov.uk forward slash prisoner visits or something like that. And they, the Power Association, didn't have his date of birth because when he left or when he was in, he'd never registered with the Power Reg Association because not everyone has to do it, right? Um, it's one of the things I involved with trying to get people to do it. She said, well, because he's not with us, we haven't got his date of birth and we didn't hold that information. But the, like, the MOD would have it, but they don't have access through. So, so it's now, they're an MOD organisation. They don't have it between the two. But what I'm saying is there is a database that exists, must be the MOD, that has all service personnel, so maybe a coroner could, as 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 part of the process, query the MOD. Do you know what the? I think there is a more simple answer to that because I think it might be quite complicated. Okay. A request, you know, for freedom of information or so forth. 
um, is actually having it on NHS records because the coroner will have access to the NHS records. So therefore, if it was on the NHS database, so like when you go to your GP, yeah, um, an, there was a, um, how do you say, there was, um, what's, uh, they're thinking the wrong word, um, Recently up north, a There's GP a had done a... There's a problem with this. What's problem. that one? There's a problem. Go on. He, go they on had done like um, a general, how do you say, um, like a little trial. Oops. Sorry. Oops. Um, done a trial um, about you having veterans or serving military within their what, GP surgery mm-hmm. and having people like, I guess, like combat stress already do. They go out and they do things about PTSD and bloody blah and educate. Um but for the GP to do have that, they have to request it. It's not a um, so that veteran will get a service. So he will be, you know, you usually get allocated to a doctor, but you never see that particular doctor. When you're serving, you mean? No, no, when you're out a veteran, yeah, like yeah, a yeah. normal civil, like, yeah. civilian population. Yeah. Or actually within this, the veteran will see that Pacific doctor. Yeah. Unless they're not that that will be their primary carer. They will get you know, they will, I guess I go, go ahead of the list. The GP will probably, you know, will be the one person kind of looking through all of the information that's coming about that veteran. So we'll specifically look at their care. So it won't be spread um, all over that GP surgery because obviously in, you know, within civilian GPs, if something comes for a doctor, it's that duty doctor that's going through what's happened that day, you know, from the hospital or whatever, sending it through. But that information, although that duty doctor might to get to begin with, that information will go to that one GP who will correlate that information. So we'll know specifically what's going on with that GP. And you know what? Actually, in our old GP surgery, that was what happened. It wasn't a thing, but the GP that was involved with James specifically did everything to do with James, specifically took him on. But then he was kind of a standalone case. They didn't have how how did he get the medical record for the MOD? How'd you get the record? Medical how did James get? Because I, I tell you get what, get medical records. You, you have to apply for them. I, yeah, this is the thing; it's not automatic. No, it isn't. My 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 military medical records are I don't know where because when I when I left, um, I got I think I got given my med I got given my medical records somehow. I got the medical records. I don't ah, I think it was an insurance game because my hearing, and I got the records for some. I think yeah, I got given the records. So I don't know where they are now. I've got no idea. Well, my GP didn't have them. No. And if don't... I hadn't have had them, how did they get transferred? So what I'm saying is that, oh, that that's a big gap. The NHS records are. It's not a raw amount thing. See, they should be when you leave. It should. It isn't done, but it should be a case. Those records automatically go to that GP. You tell them what you're moving to. You tell them the GP surgery, but it doesn't happen. You know, I feel sorry actually for the people looking the records because they've got you know little people there and they've got so much to do, especially with you know people claiming for war pensions and so forth. The, the list is horrific, and I've had to badger those women no end, and they're so polite. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess the responsibility on all cases like the medical records, like telling your GP you're a veteran, you know, you were in the military. It's all up to yourself. Or the person in your who's looking up, you know, who's what your carer, your partner, your mother, your father is it's going to come down to them. The military, I found for all of this, except for one case, um, I found the military have just gone, well, it's nothing to do with us anymore. Mm. You know, wasn't our fault. We haven't, you know, bloody blah, blah, wasn't our fault. He was on an all arms course in Britain when he should have been on, you know, not even anywhere. He should have been on light duties, not mm. doing anything. It's an asshole. He should have said. But they, yeah, but if, if they're out, you know, it's one of those. They're not going to give it down to the lawsuit, are they? That's, no. that's, that, that's the reality. Or if, or if legisl- legislation changes, it's like any court. It's like any company or organization. They're not going to care. It's, you leave. They're not going to care. You, you're just left. I feel, to be quite honest, to fend for yourself. And it's, you know, people have good experiences. People have bad experiences. But I think when you need something, or you're asking. It isn't always plain and simple, and it should be a lot easier, mm-hmm. especially for relatives who are mm-hmm. caring. You can't, at combat stress, speak to anybody about your partner or put them forward for combat stress. And like, as a wife nowadays, I mean, I was, I was fed up with the situation, so I was quite, you know. And um, you can't ring up and speak to combat stress about your partner. You can't put them forward yourself to, to combat stress. 
you can't as a you know to yeah, apply know. you can't there has to be that particular per it has to be that person applying to combat stress for their help it can't be a wife applying on your husband's well you know behalf can you not even make a referral and say this person has to come it? no i think you well, now yeah no you can't i've had um lots of experiences i had to at one point i actually got james the woman was on the phone i was like blah, 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 you know what is going on because he's just sat in a corner doing nothing you know staring into space mm. and literally went, well, yes i give consent to bloody run i just went say yes and he said yes and that was it and it's just like why did i have to go for all of this i could have put a voice on mm. just to get information about what's going on because it is made so hard and i don't think like data protection just makes it even harder i've had to i'm now my husband's how do you say i'm legally i legally do everything for him so if i have to write something for power of attorney power, yeah so mm-hmm. yeah i do i'm in charge of the whole lot which mm-hmm. is huge stress mm-hmm. But then it takes it off him and he doesn't mm-hmm. have to worry or think and he just gets done. Mm-hmm. But yeah, most people, I've heard about a few people's husbands that want to do stuff, but just can't, you know, these forms you have to fill out or whatever. You know, you, if you're struggling in general, you know, it's because sometimes my husband's just like, just do it because I just can't, you know, don't even understand what's going, you know, what mm-hmm. is it? But yeah, it is amazingly hard. It's like yeah. hurdles. I feel like combat stress again. I like slagging it. Like, Sorry, I, I am actually like... doing work with combat stress though. Oh, there you go. In the <laughs> <laughs> I'm everywhere. Um, <laughs> I am doing research with a lady called Lucy Spencer Harper at Combat Stress in regards to effects on partners and children, effect um, with um, a part, you know whoever is in their life um, affected by PTSD mm. because actually in this country there's not a huge amount. Um, and I've been speaking to a few different charities. Staff are very supportive. I've been speaking to NHS England and they actually have it on their list to do but it's funding and time and how long that will take and I think I could speak for a few people but we need it now especially for our children because you know it's just I'm part of the Ripple Fund as well that's another organisation for you know it's a peer support group for partners uh, or the person caring for the physically injured or mental uh, mental health people with mental health illnesses um and yeah, you see it so much it's just um sorry i don't know what you're apologizing for but it's yeah. fine it's all fine um what's are you going to res- how are you going to respond to are you do you have to respond to the how does this work with the petition do you have tried, to respond to them i've tried to like, how do you do just that what's the channel back. um well i've tried to email back the defence, not the secretary for the secretary of defence. I have been speaking, yeah. but it just bounces around. And there's a specific telephone number they give you, which just takes you to the main um, defence secretary's switchboard, and you don't know who to speak to because it's never signed. Who's your local MP? It's Robert Court's MP, who has been amazing. Oh, good. Yeah, he's good. been. He's um, a veterans champion in the House of Commons. Really? Okay. Yeah, he has been hugely supportive and really open and. Has helped us an awful lot. Go down there and bang on the door of the House of Commons. Well, <gasps> Do you know what? There. I've been thinking about things like that. Have you? Did you listen to the episode with Johnny Mercer? No, I didn't. Did you know Johnny Mercer, the MP? No, I don't. So listen. There's an MP called Johnny Mercer. He's um the MP for uh, oh god, Plymouth, Plymouth. Johnny for Plymouth. That's his. I'm not. I don't have. I don't have a political. I don't have a political allegiance. But Johnny is ex. Um, is ex two man commando. Okay. Uh, ex officer. Um, yeah, did various tours and stuff. And now he's yeah, he's the MP for Plymouth at the minute. But he is. You want to look him up because this is nothing. Who's your MP? Sorry. Not, Robert Court MP. Don't want to take yeah. any away from him at all. Okay, I don't know the guy. Right. <laughs> I'll make him listen I'm, to this. <laughs> I uh, only talk to Johnny because I met him personally, and and because I've met him, I sort of more he's more on my radar, and he is, in a huge way, pushing the veterans' mental health thing. There, massive, massive. So I, I I'll, I'll yeah. try and connect you well, two up. I I'm sure it can help. Everybody on the select committee that issued the report, um, and I got one. Issued the report in response to, to your. No, no, no. Issued the report in 
the big report into mental health in and 2015 then, yeah, yeah that report and i emailed every single person who was on that report mm-hmm. one person got back to me who was that was it positive it was hugely positive oh really yes it was hugely positive okay. and um supportive of the petition yeah about the way things are recorded, but yeah. also really supportive in the fact that more needs to be done. Um, and it was an amazing... I wasn't expecting a response like that, to be quite honest. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an amazing boost. I can't remember what it was. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, it's really early on. I have written to Harry, Prince of Wales, mm-hmm. not, not Prince of Wales, the Prince Harry. Mm-hmm. No response back yet, so if you're listening any chance Mm -hmm. um and i wrote to the prince of wales because he was my husband's commander-in-chief of his regiment oh really so i thought you know yeah might as well give it a go but no response to that it's been i wrote to them the same week i started the petition so it's been a fair while the best way to do it is not to expect a response like applying for a job don't expect a response you better keep banging at the doors i'll definitely hook it with johnny um what was i going to say there what the heck was i going to say to you then um Right, the petitions are three, 30 and a half thousand, you know. Yes. When did you start the petition? It was in end of July. So it's, it's, you got until July 2019. No, six months. No, you got until months January, January 2019. End of January. And then the petition finishes. Yes. And if you get it to 100,000 by January 2019, then it has to be heard in the House of Commons. Wow. It can be heard in the House of Commons, not all are. Ah. Mm. Ah. Yeah, stumbling block, isn't it? Ah. Like, yes. So, it, yeah, it should be, it it can be debated in the House of Commons, but there's no guarantee that it will be. If you look on the .gov site, you'll see the ones that have been debated. It will show you those, um, you know, fantastic. If it got to 100,000, amazing. It, you know, it's not just about it being debated in Parliament. It's about people looking and reading. Yeah. And maybe thinking, hmm, I don't know, I'll read a bit more about, I'll look at, you know, Google, whatever, and I'll read a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's having, how do you say, more getting more knowledge out there to people about the situation. Because I think some people can look and think, oh, you know, well, you know, it's one person, but it's, it's not. And actually, to be quite honest, if that one person or their family cannot go through what they've gone through then it's worth it if we can you know to do something or uh, i would i always think with this what i started and i told my husband i started it was because if i can stop one family going what we have gone through because he has tried to commit suicide in the past twice Mm -hmm. you know he's got sections um i mean the reasons around this section are quite interesting themselves i I I've heard the term section before, and um, my I don't I have not got full understanding of it. To me, it's uh, they came and took him away and locked him up because he went crazy. Wow! You don't have to listen. I'm not he... asking you to detail. What 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 is if if someone is sectioned, what what is that? What happens? It's a legal term. Okay. So um, they basically at that point legally. It's but not. I don't want to liken it to prison, but it you know they have to go. Because be they're dangerous the themselves yes. or others. It's a legal need. Um, there's different types of sectioning. Um, so I is, was, it, is it an ambulance that comes? An amb- I wasn't even there. Um, right. I don't think my husband will mind. Um, for about a week before my husband was sectioned, I was constantly ringing the mental health team because I felt that the situation wasn't tenable. It was, in, it was becoming un- unsafe and it was becoming just uncopable for me and my children but nobody came out to see him I was told by the psychologist that he wasn't he's not sectionable and it's like well, you haven't even seen him you just haven't even spoke to him you know anyway on one morning he was obsessive about his wallet simple thing his wallet he was convinced I had it and at this point I'd already got my son my oldest son to school and um I had my other three children in the car to go to my mum's just to get, you know, get away. And um, he was just on about his wallet, just fixated. And anyway, he came out of the house with a golf club and took a golf club to the car with me and my children in it. 
and I went and he proceeded in our other car to follow us and, and you drove kind of, off yeah well I drove off and he followed us and hit us from behind not hard but still yeah. you know frightening in front of on the crossroads of Carterton in front of everybody and so I kept going I was going to drive into our Prize Norton actually and um and because I thought he was still following me but he must have gone and when I looked and I was going to pull into our Prize Norton I thought no because I don't want to cause a you know a scene um so I drove to the police station in my um local in Whitney so yeah it was so police proceeded because I was on the phone to them on my hands free at the time when he was following me he just already hit my car and um yeah we he ended up getting arrested um funny enough the uh, military police turned up although he's not military and um yeah there was a lot of people there and um he was taken to the local mental health team and from there he was taken to the ment local mental health hub basically where he was sectioned by two doctors um, one so, um, social adult social worker mm -hmm. they all have to be in agreement for it to happen because it's a legal thing um, yeah I mean, it was a very interesting day um, um, so you went into sort of care then I suppose yeah he was oh, how, in, how does that work he was in a high like high security wing of the hospital say, of the hospital was it a mental health hospital or was yeah, it a general hospital it was a mental health hospital in okay. Oxford um and yeah he he was fine he was having three meals a day or you know and i think the thing was getting to him was that he was enclosed in because he prefers being outside it's better for him to be you know not enclosed you mean outdoors outdoors yeah he yeah. prefers it there yeah. and um you can see a change of personality when he's outdoors it's amazing and um but that really affected him. And I guess I was getting messages that this other person within the, that had been sectioned also was being quite aggressive to him. And he's like, oh, you know, I can't cope with this because I feel the like- The person who sectioned him? One no, 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 no. One, 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 one of the people that was actually in, had already been sectioned. Oh, sorry. Right. So my legal entitlement as his nearest relative is to ask for him to be released within that was a week so i requested that because i felt like you have a detrimental impact on him i so. thought i thought things were going to get much worse and you know were I, you in constant contact with him when he was in so. he had his mobile yeah oh really yeah he had his mobile he even do you know what really surprised me he you know on facebook you can pinpoint where you are you can mm. whatever whatever it's called he did it so we all could see all of his friends and they were like What's up with you? And he's just, I'm like going, oh my god, does nobody know? You know yeah. what is going on? Because when just before he was sectioned, we'd had our fourth child, and I wasn't feeling very well. And it ended. They thought um, he'd well, he was towards Christmas. I don't know why he just got so wet up. He he left and he just went up to Wales and he got drunk with his mate. You know. And there's me text saying I don't feel well. Tell his mate I need him to come home because I need to. Ended up I had to go to hospital with the baby because I thought I had sepsis. And you know I ended up having. But is that a mental health problem, or is this that ignoring the situation at home? It's hard to. It's the whole thing. It's hard to weigh up if you see what I mean. So, so it comes it's... back to when you when you said uh, what an hour ago now about um. When, when you said that when the title of that organization in that health was complex and they said he was too complex to deal with any any psychological issue whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing you know is flipping complex and you can't and 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 that situation there would the that was um that would have been a product of a, a million different thoughts yeah. over a million different seconds over a million different places over, over the last you know, God knows how many months before it, because it, it, so everything, every little bit of stimuli you uh, experience day to day has an impact on who you are and what you do and where you go with it. And the way your brain is made up is there is the determining factor in how you deal with that stimuli, which is why everyone is impacted in different ways, yeah. which is why you could walk out of here, all right, 
being a flipping bomb blast. Touch wood, none of that. I'm outside by the studio, <laughs> right? Being a bomb blast and walk away unscathed, physically and mentally. I never ever have an issue. Never ever have an issue ever. You could be uh, uh, then you could have, have, a, have a, um, uh, I don't know. You could have a soldier who's a member of logistics, who's a chef in Camp Bastion, never left, but experiences some things in the camp in Bastion, which we, you know, nothing on the ground, but can come away and suffer from PTSD. It doesn't mean they're any less of a person. It just it, it, everyone is different. It Everything doesn't is complex. discriminate between what you've done and what you have done. It's um... It is hard. Sorry, it is hard. You have to apologize. It's hard for the person. And it's hard for the absolutely. You know the outside. Yeah. Sorry, talk too much. It, yeah, <laughs> this program is a good thing. <laughs> now you are. You are fair enough. It's fine. Um. It is. I. It is. You know. It is difficult. I, I mean. I. I. I feel for you. I feel for. I feel for James as well. But you know, there's there's, there's so much strength there as well in that. You you're talking to me and describing things about him, what he's done, and the way he is, and you're saying he won't mind me saying that. That's huge. He's this. It's so, that's such a a a a, a, a pride swallowing thing to do, but it, it it helps, you know, and it helps him. It's helping others, and 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 you, I think it's absolutely shite what you're going through, what you've gone through, but. What you're doing now, especially with the petition and other things, and you help it with combat stress and 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 that, and it's amazing. It's a shit. Yeah, it's a sh- it's a shame that you've had to go through what you're going through to be able to have the positive impact you're having now. And I and I I hope you feel like for yourself and for James, things are improving. I do hope that. I I do, <laughs> yeah. and I hope they improve further. You know, um, I I, uh, I don't, don't, don't. It's it's the fact that is, I thought this was just us. You know it was a crazy family it was you know it was us mm-hmm. you know i've got lots of friends lots of military friends and i'm not seeing it happen to them you know um and and then i you meet some people and you get directed somewhere like the ripple pond or the boss page or whatever and you think actually i'm not so abnormal there's a lot of this going on and whether you're with your part, you're with that person or not, you still have the consequences of that. Especially if you've got children, mm-hmm. that you know your mum and dad or whatever that you know, however that works, your children are always going to be the thing that kind of gathers you together. And whether you're not, they're always going to be impacted by what's going on, whether they're in that house or not. And that is my reason to keep going. Because I love my husband, no matter. It doesn't matter. He's a great person. I mean, he used to be, you know, he was well liked in his regiment. People would call him a cunt, apparently. But, you know. <laughs> Drop in the sea, Bob. <laughs> Sorry, that was a huge moment. Um, but, <laughs> you know, he was so outgoing. And just, like, it was, you know. Re- and now, I, you know, I'm with him. And I just think, my God, what has happened to that person? Where has that person gone? Have I just been left with the shell of a person? Am I getting the end part of this? I think, no. You know, we are going to come through this and we're going to level out um, things, not going back to normal, but they'll be on a level setting. I mean, last year at the section, that was about as low as we could go. You know, I, you know, hopefully we can never go any lower. Um, But that is my reason to keep going and to actually do stuff because... I believe there's an awful lot more there to do for everybody involved. Mm-hmm. And it's my my coping mechanism as well, mm-hmm. is to kind of channel my everything that's going on into other things and to go, well, actually, I may have had a quite shit experience, but actually I can use that and mm-hmm. I can use it as a positive and say to somebody, you know, there is this or there is that or, you know, let's work together and let's get further along. So, mm-hmm. yeah, this is my positive outcome. Mm. Well, life's a journey, right? Yeah, exactly. Peaks and troughs, and uh, and some troughs for people are deep and not other troughs other people have. And same for the peaks. Um, and you don't start off as a person and stay that person for your whole life, you know. Um, uh, and you're on you're on the up now. It's just a question of the struggle of getting up because going uphill is fucking difficult. It is. When you <laughs> as you get near the top, it gets easier. <laughs> you know? And uh, and and it's. 
I just recognizing that you, you're gonna you change as a person throughout, yeah. And you're having an absolute nightmare. James is having an absolute nightmare, you know. But like you're saying, you love each other. You got amazing children, and you you're doing good things for each other and for other people. Um, and I can't I, I can't say how you're not going to continue on an upward slope. It's just it's just hard. I hope I can help. I hope I can help. I think you're on onto something there. Going um, when you were mentioning about the VA, America with that VA with that overarching sort of coordinating organization. I wonder if that, I wonder if that may be a way forward in the UK because there's this call for reform. That's the words being used: a reform of of military charities and that mental health charities, not just military, mental health charities, yes, civilians definitely. as well. Reform of it because of the things that you and I described today. Um, of what you've described today in the difficulties with it um i don't think it can be reformed because i don't think it can be reformed the organization themselves can't be reformed but what you could do is add something on i know like you're saying overarching coordinating organization fucking hell these days it could just even be a bit of bloody software you know what i mean yeah. there's some there's some knowledgeable dude or lady at the top going uh, you know pushing the buttons um it doesn't have to be a, a, a huge organization that takes up a bloody office block and needs three thousand people and all that we've passed that but it could just be coordinating bodies taking that information in being that 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 organization that goes okay joe blogs has left the army now or jesse or jasmine blogs has left the army the navy the air force now so i need to get their medical records i need to and i need to keep hold of those so they come in and they need to transfer them to whatever GP brings them on. So I need to keep them, you know, that, that somehow that's not easy, mind. but that, that, you know, and then, okay, J- Jasmine Blogs is coming to help the heroes, needs assistance, and they're going to put the HS. And that VA coordinates it. All of a sudden, the charities have to try and talk to each other. No one knows what is going on. And the person who needs the help, like James, or the person who's helping the person who's help, the spouse, like yourself, has got no idea we're gone. They got a single point of contact. What's going on, Mr. VA or Mrs. VA? Oh, well, that person said this, comes just in this, and we and docket, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. You might have hit something there. I didn't know about the VA. You might have hit something there. I think it would be an amazing thing if people weren't constantly going in circles. If what? That, sorry. People weren't constantly going in circles because mm. that's what a lot of it is. And my knowledge is via other people's experiences, mm-hmm. is mainly from that. So actually, within everything, we've got a huge ditch. Well, we've got a huge reference to go to in all these people and all different experiences, because that's what I've kind of picked up, picked up from different people, mm-hmm. amazing people. Mm-hmm. But like you say, a VA would stop people having to pick from people or, or you know, having to struggle to find that information. And right, be there. And you know what? Some university student may be listening to this, maybe part of your course you'd like to you know experiment doing this kind of thing or come up with some idea what an amazing thing to do Mm -hmm. that would be it would connect everybody because that is the problem it's connection and you shouldn't have to keep having to reapply to different places it should be a case of right you do apply one thing and that information goes over to them you know you do that one central form about everything and then once you're there, well, if you need that, then we can send it there. Mm. You know, if, like you say, in this day and age, what couldn't be easier in electronic form? Things to connect stuff, take out the middleman mm. and just do it like that. I mean, even if all the main charities came together and would talk to each other about this kind of thing, but would that happen? Would they all get in the same room and talk about... Well, you wouldn't need to, would you? It'd be legislation. No, so... Oh. We're, we're... Well, Sorry. well, I know, I know. It'd be, God, this is me. What, 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 but for me, as simple as it is, it's, it's this simple. Yeah, <laughs> you have, you have. We call it the VA. You have your V. Oh, is it must be veterans? I don't know. Whatever. We call it the VA right now. <laughs> don't, don't Google. <laughs> Do it again. Google is not a guest in this show. <laughs> um, uh, you have the organisation. Okay, so you establish it and say this is the organisation and this is who. No, charities would want to do it. They would want to do it. They want. I tell you why, because they should want to do it. 
for the, like the altruism and 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 the, just the willingness to want to truly help people because they it would make their lives easier this passage of information i know someone okay who went into that circle and ended up out of the circle without anything being accomplished so went in the circle round the houses and all of a sudden was end up out of the circle was not fixed out of the circle and and he thinks that is because the number of organizations he was involved with they all assumed that the people who passed off to the other ones it all been fixed and because they'd not heard back sorted sorted out of the circle i think another problem is though that charities have like everybody there's a lack of finance within things for them so mean? where they allocate so i don't know if you look at the rbl for the people um supporting doing more pensions so they've got to go to court i mean they those people in the different areas there's what a f- three four people in those departments they're going all over the country to represent people and they're doing god knows how many hours to so support, allocation you know, resources yeah I mean, yeah, but, 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 but that's not that because there's no money in the rbl it's because it's because, um, especially this day and age, I would suggest it's because I'm not saying it is because because I don't know. I would suggest part of the issue is the allocation of resources, is that the money's there, right? Within the RBL, yeah, the money is there, but because there is so much shit thrown at a charity, if they are not seen to be contributing ninety nine point nine percent of their money directly to someone who needs it, then they get they they don't. They don't, which is why you get organisations like a Healthy Heroes, like uh, like like the RBL, like other organisations, who are sitting on a huge amount of money, which is growing, and they they cannot spend it. How do they spend it? They can't. Give them a new laptop, give them a bike, give them this, give them that. Yeah. And I know the examples of this, because they've got to spend the money, and it's got to go direct to the veteran. But that's not the best way to deal with things. For me, it's like you're saying... Imp- the charity should be allowed to operate as a company, yeah. okay? They sh- it should be. They should be. It shouldn't be. Um, it shouldn't be. Uh, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna base. We're gonna base uh, your performance in the charity um, on how much, uh, what percentage of your revenue goes direct to the person or or people you're trying to help. That's the wrong way of doing it. It's the wrong way of doing it because you can't operate like that. A a charity operates like a company, right? If they haven't got the infrastructure behind them to be able to grow and increase, then they're going to hit a ceiling where there's only so many people that can help. Yeah. And then it sinks. It fucking sinks, right? Uh, And that's the same for a company. I think I spoke about this before. Wait, I have spoken In fact, I think the first episode with Jordan Wiley actually, it sinks because they're not allowed to spend that money on the the resources and the and the logistics and all the rest of it. So what happens is you get the mistreatment, misdiagnosis, people not knowing what the fuck is going on. People get the laptop, and actually, I just need I just need someone to talk to. I yeah. just need someone to talk to. Have yeah. found that you yeah, the charities are quite willing to throw money at you, but actually, well, that's not what we need. We need the actual support. We don't yeah. need the money. Yeah. Although I will say thank you to Help the Heroes because when my husband got sectioned, my washing machine flooded the whole house. Well, and I had no money, and they bought me a washing <laughs> yeah, machine, and, and you got yeah. it delivered straight away. So you know things like that. You know, I see. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's fantastic because actually within that need, I think I may have fallen apart if somebody hadn't helped me at that part. That was a bit that was going to push me right over the edge. Yeah. And um, but the like you say, the money is you know can't we just give this, give that, buy a laptop. Because it doesn't solve but, anything. But that's, that's pub, it's public perception of, of, of what should and shouldn't happen. It's the way media portray it. And uh, and it's a misunderstanding of the way they work. If you if you allow charities to operate as as uh, to operate as companies, listen, the way char- the aim of a charity, right, is to get as much spare cash as it can to do with what it wants. Mm. The aim of a company is to get as much spare cash cash as it can and do with it what it wants right a company that's called profit and they dish it out to the shareholders and stakeholders and owners a charity that's called money they can fucking donate right 
Which is better at making money and sustaining itself? A company is, because companies have been around, <laughs> they've been a lot more than around for a lot longer. Right, Chinese been around for a while, yeah, and the same would be ancient. But a company operates, a company operates the most efficient way, streamlined way of making money. Charities are not allowed to do it. They're not allowed to do it because it's not seen to be the right way to do it. Now, all your money's going to go on this. All your money, as much money. What do you mean you spent fucking 20 million on marketing? Yeah, but hang on a minute. Because I spent 20 million on marketing, we were able to increase the amount of money we were able to give away by 10 million. Yeah, but, yeah, but that's only 10 million. Well, I'll tell you what, we won't spend 20 million on marketing. We were able to increase the amount of donation we had to make by 10 million. What the fuck are we doing? But then, you know, with that example, I want to tear my eyes out of this because I don't know if a while ago, Combat Stress changed their logos, changed their branding as a charity. £40,000 on their logo. Mm -hmm. And you just think, you're you're saying you're struggling to, you know, to fund things. And you're spending 40000 You just close the centre <laughs> yeah, down. Yeah, 40 grand. 40000 And it doesn't look, doesn't, to me, it's like, yeah, I like the other one better. But, you know... I'm looking at the company thing again. Yeah, oh, for, 40, like 40 for 40 grand. grand. For 40 grand, right? For 40 grand, and I'm speculating here, but for 40 grand, there would have been analysis going into it. There would have been like a uh, uh, um, uh, return on investment. Look at it, right? Because 40, fuck, because it was, let's see, the organization go 40 grand. Yeah, but look, if we spent 40 grand over five years, the impact of that rebranding, because companies do all the time, mm. they rebrand for a reason, and they spend a lot more than 40,000 pounds. They do it because. In doing that, in the long term, they make more money. I suppose that people have to buy T-shirts again, mugs or whatever. This is the thing. It but makes more money. It's I not for no reason. But with a charity, it becomes quite a divisive issue because I, then you're like, oh, that centre's just closed down. I that agree. 40 grand was really important. Yeah, but 40 degrees not going to keep the centre open. Oh, but if true. that 40 degree rebranding makes 6 million over the next five years, that's another centre. But to an ordinary person, I know. forty grand is like. I agree, and and my, my point I in could case. Buy a house in Wales for that. My point in case. I know, <laughs> Sorry. My point in case is it pissed you off. Oh, yeah. 40, forty grand rebranding. There's a reason it did it because the ROI outweigh the ROI is positive. There's return on investment. There's no way. I mean, look at this way, right? If chat, if a chat, let's say combat stress and the people at the top, they want oh, that's more money in my fucking sky rocket, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's more money in my pocket. They're gonna go forty grand on a, on that. Ain't doing it. They've done it because it makes more money. Obviously, they don't think that they want to help. Yeah, people, right? They've done yeah. it because it's gonna make money in the long term. And the exact thing you're pissed off about there is the exact problem with charities being able to operate most efficiently and be able to generate the most money to be able to donate to the people they need to donate to. They're handicapped. Yeah, true. Handicapped. Completely handicapped. No, forever gonna go round these. Uh, yeah, hills. completely handicapped. Ugh. Just... Leave them, leave them, leave, leave them do, leave them operate the way they need to operate. They will find the best way possible to make the most money for the people they're trying to help. True. I mean, combat stress, you know, I can't, you know, they tell me, you said, no, I can't help my husband, but that was for a reason. But I just feel because they're, I think they're a charity that are really, you know, they have help heroes. They're quite a dominant, you say, within the, you know, within all the, mm their charities i think they're maybe in the most former most permission um position at the moment with ev out of all the charities which one do you first think of but if you did like um something on the street most people would say help for heroes and then say i'll be out nowadays whereas pre help for heroes when it was at its forefront during you know afghan and stuff because i think that got a lot of publicity then everybody would say no i'll be out i did use them to a couple of years back but then it was all help for heroes but um was, was was what I heard of, but then um, I was still in, and so my it's more so I wasn't ex as exposed to it. Yeah. Or like exposed to it in different ways. Yeah, um, yeah. We right, we we need to wrap this up. <laughs> in an hour and a half. Tell me, um, so you anything? Who you who or what do you want to mention now? And in fact, firstly, how can people find your petition and sign it? They can find it on the doc, um, .gov petition site. Um, I think it's pretty still. Is it um, really? Yeah, it's still it's actually not a huge amount. You know. I'll put the link. Is in, that okay? I'll put the link on this on the on this podcast on the website. I'll that put would the be link amazing. Link to the thing. Yeah. Um, you know, if just people read it, 
then that's massive to me. Mm. I don't need to sign if they want to sign it, that is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But if you read it and look more into it, that I think it would broaden people's mm -hmm. perspective on it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to do, just reach people, you know, if this got to Parliament was debated, I'd be doing a little dance. Well, I reckon people listening now they should uh they should or watching, they should um when they share this, which they will. <laughs> uh Tag flipping Johnny. Tag Johnny Mercer. He's all over this. He's really pushing the mental health. And like I said, I've got no political allegiance. I don't care if you live them, conservative, flipping Labour. I don't, I don't give a damn. Like, however, I know Johnny. He's pushing this at the minute, so and it's relevant at the moment. So uh, you're flipping tagging. We'll, get more well if you're pushing that, then I can push the Ripple Fund for any partners or mums, dads, whoever, who yeah. are caring or are, you know, are in that situation, somebody that is physically and has you know all has mental health problems doesn't matter Con ripplepond.org.uk yeah. amazing peer group and that's for charity. spouses it's for spouses mum dad you yeah. know there's, there was one male on there but i'm not sure they're there now but it is for female and male it's not although it's female dominant at the moment yeah it is open so if you ripplepond.org.uk yeah okay good plug no yeah absolutely plug away who else do we mention um, combat stress we will combat thank stress. combat stress definitely yes. battle back battle back, battle yeah. back on course foundation mm -hmm. um fantastic charities please do apply um what else oh i must say thank you to military wise choir because bryce norton who have kept me going <laughs> and has supported me my wives mm -hmm. i don't think i could have done it without them a little tear they have been my rock and especially a few people there who I'll say, Emma Jackson, Karen, 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 and um, yeah, so they've been fantastic to me. Good. Sorry. Good. It's fine. Stop apologising. And anybody that still, you know, if your husband or your son isn't still in the military, but you have that connection, you can actually join the military wise choirs that are all around or the country. Daughter. You do, or daughter. Yeah, you do not need to have a serving member of the military still in. If you have that connection and you have a choir near you, mm -hmm. Oxford, you have Vista Benson, Bryce Norton. Please, you get in contact. Cool. We'd love to see you. Okay, thank you for your time and good luck with everything. And if I can help, call me. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. We are going. We are.